So Bill, before we start with the guest, tell us what you've been up to since the last episode because I hear great things about the work you've been doing with Playbury Laser. Well, uh, my eyes are square, Michael, because it's involved hours and hours and hours of Christy, Linda and I sitting in front of a screen um, creating using uh, PowerPoint to create the phase six and seven content, which is going to be roughly translating to years five and six. Yeah, for the, for the Play Bear Laser um, program, for our tier one, two program. So let's take a step back and yep. maybe just explain what Play Bear Laser is for people that might not have picked it up. In the last few episodes where you've mentioned it. Oh, okay. So Playberry Laser is our tier one and two literacy program, which kind of uh, was born out of Playberry tier three. Yep. Um, but a couple of years ago, Christy, Linda and I decided to to build this uh, end-to-end tier one and two literacy resource for schools um, with the idea, because uh, we've all kind of worked in schools for a long time, helping schools along the journey of transitioning their literacy teaching to evidence-based, um, we've realised how incredibly labour-intensive it is for teachers to, to create their content as well as getting their head around um, the, the, the content itself, how, what to teach. So we really wanted to develop this resource that did all the heavy lifting around content creation. Um, it's pretty tight. doesn't let teachers wander off the path. Uh, it's very tight scope and sequence. Mm-hmm. So that's what we've been up to. And we've, it's been flat out because we've gone from about seven schools to about 60 in wow. seven months, Kidding. Uh, so, subscribing to the platform, yeah, amazing. So that sounds fantastic for you and for the schools. <laughs> well, the feedback is very, very positive, which is good. It, we, we, it looks like what we wanted to set out to do. We're achieving and helping schools speed that progress. Great. Well, I reckon we should have that as a future episode because I'd love to hear more details about that because it sounds fascinating, and I think people listening are probably, you know, a good majority of them are grappling with. How do you introduce this to your school? You know, how do you get that school changed? So, I think we should stay tuned for that. All right, well, let's sounds do it. excellent. Yeah, <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to our topic for today. Welcome to Discastia, a podcast for parents and teachers about the best way to support kids living with learning difficulties. My name's Michael Shanahan, and my name's David Morkunis. No, it's not. <laughs> He's just over there. <laughs> You better my, introduce yourself, mate. My name is David Morkunis. How dare you, Bill? No, I'm Bill Hansberry. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, mate. <laughs> we are coming to you from the lands of the Ghana people, and we would like to express our respect to elders past, present, and emerging. And unfortunately, we need to acknowledge that colonisation and dispossession are ongoing processes. Thank we you. are very lucky, Michael, to have David Morkunis with us today. Uh, Because we're going to talk about daily review. We're going to review the overarching topic. But just as before we started recording, David made a very important point about Rosenshine. To to take over any point, David, Mm. Rosenshine talks about daily review, yeah? Correct. Yes, in in Rosenshine's Principles of Instruction, which are pretty big, I guess. Um, It tends to be ground zero for a lot of what we do. But yes, anyway, we're going to talk about daily review. Because anyone who is kind of in the explicit or direct or uh, DI, capital D, lowercase i, EDI, anyway, we're all doing this thing of uh, activation of prior knowledge uh, regularly, daily, and it's not just happening in the literacy space. It is making its way, as it should, into maths and other areas where there's well any kind of biologically secondary knowledge that just needs to be Stored. So I, we couldn't think of anyone better, really, Michael, could we, than, yeah. than the, the man across from us, David Morkunis. Um, because, David, tell us, we're just going to flip to you, mate. Tell us, mm. Mork, what are, you, what are you doing these days and where have you come from? Give us a bit of a background about yourself. Yeah, so um, currently my role is as the learning specialist for numeracy at Brandon Park Primary School. There's a so- name that keeps coming up, David. Brandon Park, yeah, yeah, doing great things. They they do they do some wonderful things. So I'm uh, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, Bill. So I'm uh, I'm I'm iterating on some really wonderful programs and uh, making some of my own waves as well. Um, so my role at Brandon Park is uh, to improve collective teacher efficacy, mainly in maths, but I also do a lot of instructional coaching and and talk about ADI as well. Um, before that, I worked for about seven years at Bentley West Primary School, which is a school that your listeners would be well familiar with. Yes. So under the the great uh, leadership of Sarah. Assignment prior to that, Stephen Cap. 
So Giants in the field. Indeed, indeed. They'll be thrilled to hear you say that. Oh, <laughs> they are. I've been, uh, and David, I was lucky enough. Um, David, you and I have met because mm-hmm. really early in the bit, um, I was taking crops of principals and teachers across to Bentley West. I think we probably did six or seven tours mm. before COVID broke that, like it broke just about everything else. Indeed. Um, and I was fortunate enough, Mork, to see a lot of you teaching, or any of the staff at Bentley West teaching, but what really stuck out in the mathematics space when I watched people like you and Michael McKinnon um, running daily review around maths, not just the literacy, but the maths. And I still mm. remember with real clarity, David, watching you do times tables, doing table facts with that wonderful, it's probably old news for you now, but that wonderful tables turnarounds um, mm. uh triumph of the animation tool on uh, <laughs> on Microsoft PowerPoint. Yeah. And um, j- just watching these same principles of daily review trickle over from literacy into numeracy, David. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think, look, I think daily review is um, arguably easier to do and you see more immediate effects in the math space than literacy as well. Um, you know, literacy, uh, some of it is inherently wooly. There are lots of shades of grey, especially when we talk about um, really cognitively challenging skills like writing whereas mm. maths i think part of what i gravitate towards maths for is you know that black and white thinking like here is here is you know three and five is always going to make eight you know it's not going to make seven or nine three plus five is eight right yeah that's sort of declarative and procedural knowledge um and that kind of stuff really lends it to itself to review well because you can do it swiftly you can you can do it um quite quickly without having to get into some of the woolly nature uh, nature of it so yeah you know in a in a review you can cover a dozen or 15 topics uh, in fairly rapid succession um and that's kind of the secret source of review. You know, it's um, reviewing or touching on prior learning and doing so in a very quick uh, and efficient way, um, kind of giving kids as many exposures as possible to to previously taught information. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe if we take a little step back because um, there's a bit of jargon going on here. We, we're not, very that, excited. <laughs> yeah. That not everyone may be familiar with. And maybe if we just take a little step back and say, what are we actually talking about when we say review? Like, yes. Um, what is what do we what do we mean when we say review and and why are we talking about this thing called review yeah so it's simply the act of looking at uh, and retrieving previously taught material so right. if i teach my uh, students how to do subtraction with renaming uh, on a Monday, it's then the next school day coming in and doing a small section on, hey, this is what we covered yesterday. Mm-hmm. And it might be uh, as simple as, here's a quick reminder of the algorithm you learned yesterday. Now, here are some questions for you to do on your whiteboard or in your books. Or uh, eventually, after they've had enough practice, just straight to that end bit of like, all right, here's some subtraction. Go ahead and do it. Yep. So, yeah, daily review is simply just um, revisiting prior learnt material and doing it probably in a quicker way than you know, a formal uh, 30 or 40-minute lesson. Right. Gotcha. So you've introduced a topic. You're fairly confident, you know, the first time you've introduced it that the kids are, have, got, have got the idea of what it is. Mm-hmm. And then the next time you see them, you'll do a quick reminder of what it was. A quick check maybe to see if they've understood it yeah, or is sure. it just a straight review? Mm-hmm. No, no. So we, we, we a review, like part of the um, core tenet of review would be to constantly, and for EDI as well, for explicit direct instruction is to constantly be checking for understanding. So um, we use uh, mini whiteboards at, at every school that I've worked at because you guys know what, a, what an amazing piece of kit that is. Yeah. So um, that subtraction example will be, all right, here are four questions for you to have a, have a turn at give them some time to work them, and then call an attention signal to get them to clean their whiteboards, teacher scans, that's their check for understanding. Yep. Uh, and you know, obviously we're hoping as many kids as possible have nailed it, uh, if not potentially a reteach. So we might revisit that concept again. Mm. And so it sounds fairly logical, doesn't it? That, would you say that not many teachers out there wouldn't do a review? Or, or do you think this is something that people don't do you know, as just part of teaching. Well, I certainly yeah. had no understanding of the importance of review and um, probably spent a fair bit of my teaching career grizzling about kids can't be paying attention enough. Uh, you know, no one can tell me what a noun or a verb is and no one's remembering the table's facts. And but you've taught it. Well, that's right. But yeah. the old the old saying, just because you've taught it doesn't yeah. mean they've learned it. Um, so I certainly had a life before... <laughs> 
<laughs> before understanding the importance of a, of review. David, did you have a life before under, as a teacher before understanding the importance of review? Um, a, a, a short and uh, uneventful life. <laughs> so I did, um, <laughs> ineffective life. Yeah, so, 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 yeah, yeah, ineffective. There a waste go. of a life. Um, yeah, so, so I did uh, uh, a couple of terms of relief teaching before I got picked up at Bentley West. Yeah. Uh, and I guess it, the, my first couple of years at Bentley West, we weren't doing review anywhere near as, um, in, in a way that was anywhere near as structured as they now do it. Mm. So the first couple of years, we were still building our understanding about ADI. We're still making some fairly broad changes to the school. Mm. So really, the first year that we, in, in the team I was working in, the first year we properly embedded it would be um, like 2019. So um, I got there in 2016 to give the listeners just a, a point of reference. So I started dabbling maybe halfway through 2018, but 2019 is when we got really serious about it. And mm. my role in my team that year was purely just to work on the review decks. And so that was across literacy and maths. And so it was, you know, long evenings and weekends, mm. tinker away on uh, PowerPoint slides and, and getting the reviews uh, built up from there. Um, so to touch on what we mentioned earlier, um, when we're talking about, you know, them learning something uh on the day and then you know moving to this mastery idea it's probably the reviews kind of that bridge between performance and learning so we talk about performance is what we might see the first time that someone is taught something because you're you've you've performed that skill but you can't necessarily say that it's learned if, if we're talking about like the 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 definition of learning being a change in long-term memory yeah. If I've taught you subtraction on a Monday and you do it on a Monday, I can't say yet that you've learned it, right? But if you do that skill unprompted in six weeks from now and you're able to do it accurately and fairly quickly, then that's probably a reasonable argument to say, hey, there has been a change in your memory here. You've probably learned this. Mm -hmm. So the bridge to get from performance to learning, in my opinion, is the reviews. So it's giving them yeah. essentially more at-bats, you know, mm -hmm. first sports analogy, probably the last one, <laughs> um, and just getting uh, them enough. Uh, no, I'm going to go second one straight away. Enough runs on the board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Yep. Um, giving them enough, uh, you know, bites at the apple. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. <laughs> no, keep going. This is atrocious. <laughs> I'm liking That's this. Three and, three and done. Magic rule of three. Um, giving them enough chances to get from that performance to to what yep. we could call learning. Okay. Um, and yeah, so to answer your question, yep. Michael, I don't think a lot of teachers do this. Right. From my from my learned experience, I'm prepared to be proven wrong. Yep. Um, it happens more often than I'm prepared yep. to admit. Um, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see it a lot. And, and it's one of those things like a lot of evidence-based instruction that if I had not landed at the school that I wound up at, I wouldn't have known mm. any better. Yeah. And so maybe it's a case of, you know, generally if you're a teacher, you probably do do some reviewing, but it sounds to me like you're talking about a very structured approach to review. Yeah, most like definitely. review as, you know, an art form and a procedure that mm -hmm. you really bed down and put in a structured way into everything that you do. Yes. And so review isn't something that you might just do as part of your normal teaching practice. It's actually a very mm. laid out structured thing. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you're spot on. Yeah, so, so, so it's a non-negotiable at, at our school and, and is at Bentley West as well. So it's, a, an ex it's an expected part of our maths block. Yeah. So our maths block will include a lesson where students are exposed to new skills and concepts and that's when we use our ADI lesson template and those, those seven components of an ADI lesson. But then the review forms another part of that maths block and it's expected that you do it as often as possible. So right. uh, it, ideally every day. Um, we've got some timetabling challenges at Brandon Park, which means we can't quite do them every day but we're certainly pushing um the teams at my school to increase the frequency um and, in, in my opinion i, th I think it, uh, like my lived experience i think bears this out so it's not a thing i can point to research but i'm sure there is i think review is where the learning happens yeah. mm -hmm. like like it's obviously crucial to nail the introduction of new skills and concepts but i simply teaching something once and expecting students to be able to recall or retrieve that information in months or years from now, it, it's just a furphy. Yeah. We just know that's not how brains mm. work. Yeah. You know, so the multiple exposures is, is just, it's crucial. Mm. And I think if we're talking about kids living with learning difficulties, I would imagine that it's fairly hit and miss if you're just giving one introduction to something, whether you've even got it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because there's often really high cognitive load at that time when you're learning something new the teacher's talking maybe talking a bit too fast they're talking about prior knowledge that you don't quite have mm. and you just kind of get lost and if it's never reviewed again after that then 
you know, it's kind of double whammy there, isn't mm. it? Yeah, most definitely. And we, we know from, yeah. you know, you guys would know better than me working with children with learning difficulties. Um, we know that those students need more exposures. Yeah. You know, we talk about grapheme phoneme correspondences, you know, the uh, the average is, correct me if I'm uh, wrong, Bill, the average is like 12 or so for, a, for a, like a neurotypical kid. Yeah, a few numbers rattle around, but yes, yep. yeah, that sounds, sounds sounds like a good work, working number here. Yep. Yeah, and, and yep. They, they multiply by by an order of magnitude yes. um, for, for students who have dyslexia or other working memory issues. You know, I worked with a, um, a student who had very severe dyslexia a few years ago um, who through intervention had uh, been exposed to the same grapheme phoneme correspondence over a hundred times yeah. still hadn't gotten yeah. it. So yeah. just goes to show you like those kids need it more than, yeah. than, than anyone else. And I think the other thing to consider there as well is you can do all those repetitions and it become, can become automatic for a kid. But if you leave it for two or three weeks and don't review it, you find when you come back, it's almost like you've never done it. Mm, you know what yes, I mean? They yes. can lose it very quickly if they don't use it. You know, I find after school holidays, kids come back and, yeah. you know, there's a big chunk of stuff that they've forgotten. Now, it doesn't take them long to get back into the swing of it. Yeah. You know, once you've reviewed and reviewed and, you know, you have to reteach a couple of things. But I think that drop-off, I'm not sure if there's research around this, but my experience is that drop-off for kids living with learning difficulties is probably a bigger drop off. Yeah, it's a steeper cliff. Than than kids who, mm. you know, neurotypical yeah. kids. There's a couple of threads there that are I think are really important to pick up on. Um Mork, you talked about the bridge from sorry, what was it? From from performance from to learning. Performance to learning and then we're in a conversation about what long term memory decides to put away. And there's a um I was listening to a podcast no, what was it? John Sweller. Speaking now, John Sweller, Sweller for those people who don't know, is the father of cognitive load theory. And John Sweller was talking about working memory being having having a protective device so it can't be altered. And more, you talked about learning is an alteration of long term memory. Mm -hmm. And Sweller, I'd never heard it put this way, said so the long term memory is set up so it can't be just altered by experience. Because if you can imagine if your long term memory could be altered by any experience, just one off then we wouldn't function very well. It was, weren't, it weren't his words, but it was his implication. So one of the ways we signal to long-term memory that it needs to change is through repetition. Is that a fair way of putting it? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think I, I, I certainly don't have anywhere near the understanding of uh, cognitive load theory that the Godfather uh, himself does. Yeah, um, of course. But that yeah. that seems to be that seems to be reasonable. Yeah. Yes. Um, and we we know like when we talk about um, like Ebbinghaus's forgetting That's curve. That's right. Uh, we know that the more for 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 people who aren't aware, it's um, based on a researcher from the nineteenth century, Herman Ebbinghaus, eighteen eighties Herman. Yeah, oh, yep. really? yeah this yep. is like a almost one hundred and fifty year old idea. And to, yep. to give um, listeners the background, he um, essentially taught himself a bunch of like um, like nonsense, nonsense syllables, syllables yeah. yeah, and then. Uh, tested himself after a delay and sort of noted down what he was able to retain. And what he discovered from that is the more often that we review information, the amount that degrades over time is lessened. So you might, this is arbitrary, but just for, for mm. illustrative purposes, you might forget 50% after a day. Then after a couple of reviews, in, all of a sudden you might just start forgetting maybe 30% after mm. a day. Then after a few more reviews, maybe 10% per day. Mm -hmm. Like like I, I heard someone once say that there's actually no such thing as a purely long-term memory. Like if you don't review- All memory degrades. Yeah, exactly yeah, right. So like yeah. in theory then, we could stick you in a forest for 50 years and you never hear another human speech sound you might forget your own first name right the mm. reason we don't <laughs> is we hear them every single day and yes. so we're getting that accidental review without meaning to mm. but yeah um, Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve um, kind of goes to explain the, the power of reviews you yeah know? And, and some people are gener generous enough to refer to Herman Ebbinghaus as the father of cognitive psychology mm. because what Ebbinghaus learned about not just the importance of review, but the importance of spacing between reviews. Just, just by, he was his own. He was his own n equals one study, wasn't he? But that what he has learned is one of the most replicated experiments in cognitive psychology. Uh, that that, and then you add on to the whole idea of massed versus space. Well, that's massed versus space practice, and then the interleaving comes in. But these are really, really robust findings mm. in cognitive psychology about memory. So, so the working memory is hard to alter because it's got that protective you thing mean built in memory? sorry that no the the long term memory sorry you're right long term memory is hard to alter because it's got that protective mechanism so it can't change overnight 
and one thing I say to my kids is the one how you tell your brain to store it is through repetition. Mm. Repetition is like a set of instructions you send to your brain. So at that night while you sleep, your hippocampus knows mm. to store it in long-term yeah. memory. That's Rep- my understanding repet- of it. Yeah, repetition. And I mean, I say a similar thing, Bill. I probably got it from you. But I also tell the kids that it's about attention. Yes. Repetition and attention. Yeah. Because you can repeat something. And we can all do this. You know, you can have something rabbiting off in your head, but actually you're thinking about something else or, you know, not actually paying attention to it. But yeah. Really taking that moment when you're doing that repetition to pay complete attention to what it is mm. really alerts your brain to say, hey, this is something to remember. Yes. So are we, we should probably quickly talk about attention mm. here because if we're trying to review and we've got kids looking left, right, upside down and thinking that's a nice clock, um, surely the review is not effective. Mork, what do you got on the whole idea of attention and where kids need to be looking and... Yeah, well, so this is something I'm going to steal from uh, from Ollie Lovell. Yep. Uh, oh, so Ollie, he had a, Ollie Lovell. Uh, my, my, I always say this, my good friend, Ollie Lovell. <laughs> love, love, to, love to talk about clout like that. Um, so he, he had a, a wonderful episode with Craig Barton recently on his podcast because they're doing those monthly episodes together. And they were talking about instructional coaching. And I was listening to it because that is a, that's part of my role this year. And they, they've said that they're, when they're doing coaching, there is no point at, at giving teachers feedback feedback about complex pedagogical ideas like not going into a classroom and being like ah look your skill development wasn't quite correct uh, and you know you could have done your turn and talk a bit better here's how to do it unless the absolute fundamentals are there and the two fundamentals they spoke about well the, the, actually the one is just attention mm-hmm. right like I, I kind of lump behavior in there as well because behavior and attention are of course so closely linked but yeah if you're if your students are not paying attention, like it's a fool's errand to assume that any learning is going to happen from yeah. there. So everything we do as teachers, the, the absolute ground level basic stuff is to ensure that our students' attention is where we're trying to direct it to. Mm. You know, anything beyond that, as I said, is, is just you know, you're laughing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Anita Archer's question, what do you want them looking at? What do you want them thinking about? Yeah. Is, is key. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... We know that it's important, mm-hmm. um, and I think we've probably talked about why it's important. Do you think there's any more to say about that, the, the kind of science behind the importance of review? I think that probably covers it. I think it does. Yeah. Mm. So not everything gets into long-term memory. It gets in there through review. Attention is the gateway. Mm. Um, and repetition. Yeah. And, and maybe repetition. I think maybe what I'd add in there would be that you've got to be reviewing it um, precisely. Right. Like you don't want to be repeating something in a sloppy fashion yeah. because you make that the automatic thought or the automatic function, you know what I mean? Mm. I'm, th- I'm thinking of perhaps more related to a physical skill like handwriting. Mm. You don't want to be repeating the letter E a hundred times in a sloppy way. You know no. what I mean? Because that automates that yeah, sloppy you're, you're pattern. Embed, you're you want to do a really practice. good E yes. yeah, a hundred times and yep. that's about that focus and that attention and you know, really getting it right. And mm-hmm. I imagine the same with your thought processes. You've got to be quite precise with what you're practicing because yeah. what you practice is what's going to become your learned. automated yeah. habit. Yeah, no, yeah. exactly learned. right. If, if you've if you've accidentally taught a misconception and then you review it a hundred times, guess what? Your, your students have just yeah. transferred into long term memory. Yep. Yeah, oh, lucky I've never yeah. done that ever. No, no, yeah. no, none of us have. No, none of us have. Surely. <laughs> yeah. So it's fairly high stakes, isn't it? This Most review definitely. part, because as you say, yes, as a teacher, and I, and I suppose you know, thinking aloud now, as a teacher. Most of your focus is on how well can I teach this, isn't it? You know, you think a lot about how am I going to deliver this so the kids will understand it mm. in this sort of introductory session. And, you know, a lot of, for me anyway, a lot of my effort goes into thinking, how can I explain this so that the kids are going to understand it? How much do I need to break it down and so on? But if, as you say, that introductory session is just that and we don't review it afterwards, mm. then we're really kind of maybe spending too much effort on the wrong thing. Maybe yeah. not the wrong thing, but, yeah. you know, that's not where the rubber hits the road from what I'm hearing. Um, so is there some sort of science to it? Like when you say you have a structured approach to it, what does that actually mean? What does that look like in a school that has a structured kind of disciplined approach to review? 
Oh, big question, Michael. <laughs> yeah. Big question. Yeah, so I'm, I'll, I'll talk about the math space because that's where I'm most comfortable. But these, these generally, these principles do work in in almost every subject area, including specialists like uh, PE, music, and all the all the fun ones as well. Um, so how it looks like in maths is we've we've begun with a whole school scope and sequence. So this is what every year level teaches on you know on this week of this term of on this day right from there the teams are then uh the teachers will need to build their own uh instructional resources for them uh, you know, or you could use you know resources like the the guys at oka do and that sort of thing as well but at my school we're building all those resources in house mm-hmm. um that way they adhere to exactly what we expect from our teachers mm-hmm. because They're you in- want consistency yeah yeah, yeah. so mm-hmm. it's all about it's all about lowering variance because we know yeah. that um increased variance leads to uh lower student outcomes so we're trying to to squ- watch the variance out as well as much as possible um the benefit of making our own resources in-house is they can adhere to all the language we want throughout maths so i should be able to hear similar language when my prep team are doing addition to you know my grade four and five doing addition as well Mm. just the complexity will be increased so first is the scope and sequence then the lesson materials and then part of those lesson materials are then um transferred into a review deck so I just think monstrously large PowerPoint files. Yeah. Uh, the grade five one at the moment is uh, north of two thousand slides. Right. Wow. So you know, oh, in one PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. We're, we're using PowerPoint in a way that it definitely wasn't designed for. So um, <laughs> our, our, poor, does that, yeah, our poor laptops <laughs> sometimes start smoking when you when you try and open a file. Uh, yeah. So from there. Uh, that, that's like our master review deck. We just take the slides that we want to use from there and they become our daily review uh, files. So there are, there are certain topics in maths that I would consider non-negotiables in review. So things that I want kids to touch um, basically all the time. Uh, and they're the, the fairly complex um, procedural stuff. So um, long form multiplication, long division, that kind of stuff. In the upper years, I want them hitting that almost every time we review. Uh, and in the lower years, it would be something like, you know, a lot of subitizing and basic fact fluency stuff. Mm-hmm. Like let's run through some addition facts and things like that because they're real bang for buck things aren't they yeah and they're they're, they're this kind of they're the absolute cornerstone of primary mathematics it's you can't do it without having those yeah it's basic facts and the four operations if you've got all of that you are you're off to the races right but if you don't then it's it's a completely other uh, different story so and then we, we essentially just bring in other topics based on what has been taught. It might be stuff that we've taught yesterday, last week, last term, last year. Uh, and then we have a lot of discussions within our team uh, about what our students are comfortable in uh, with in review and what we think they're not comfortable with. Mm. So sadly, uh, or to my knowledge at least, the research doesn't point to this beautiful Goldilocks zone of like, all right, you teach a topic on day zero, you put it in for X number of days, take it out for Y number of days and put it back in on day Z, uh, for example. Because that's what I was going to ask more. Yeah, I was going to go, give us the like algorithm. That. No, there is, there's no beautiful <laughs> formula. So it is, it is fairly wishy-washy in that. Look, the research says that um, and we talk about you know, retrieval practice, which is the act of bringing uh, information from your long-term memory into your working memory, which is one of the big things that review does. Mm. The research about retrieval practice says it's, a, it's most effective when you are starting to forget that information. Yeah, right. And then, of course... Yeah. The classic follow-up is, well, when is that? Mm-hmm. And, and do I don't know? have an answer yeah. for you. Exactly yeah. right. So you, you do have to kind of do it a bit by feel yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, unless someone can point me to some research that says otherwise. Which so is that's difficult why, with a whole class. Yeah, exactly because every right. every kid would be at a different point of... Yeah, either at, you know being remembered or not remembered, yep. and and that depend what they're remembering depends on uh, prior knowledge or background yeah. knowledge to that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. It's, it's 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 hugely variable. Yeah. So in in a one to one one on one tutoring situation, it would be a lot a lot simpler. But of course, in whole class, we just have to kind of like not wing it. But we, there is some intention there. But um, it's not an exact science. Yeah. No. Um, but it so, sounds like you really cover the bases with the basic facts. Yeah. So at least you know that those basics are not going to get left out or forgotten or you know not. Or the kids aren't going to learn them. Yeah, exactly right. And there are a few others like we will hit um, some sort of time um, most weeks, maybe not every day, but at least once a week. So in grades three to four, it might be reading analog clocks. Uh, four to five might be converting between 12 and 24-hour time, that sort of stuff. Yep. Things that are you know quite real world-based that um, are crucial for them to know, regardless of whether what they want to go on and study further maths. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like we, we try and meet uh, within our teams fairly regularly um, to talk about the things that we think should go out and the things that should come back in. Um, so at least then it's not um, one teacher making those calls and it's at least a collective decision. Um, and, you know, that's hopefully removing a bit more of the variance, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So if you're going to err on uh, one side of things, 
um, you, you will probably err on the more review rather than less review side of things because you just want to cover your bases, I guess. Yeah, definitely. And that's kind of how, I mean, I've, you know, in my intervention teaching, because it's actually the intervention space that taught me originally uh, the importance of review. Um, it was something that people who work with kids in the dyslexia space knew. It was just part of the meat and two veg of a, of a lesson. So when I started to see models like explicit direct instruction with a built-in review, I'm looking at that and going, oh, that's just like what we do mm -hmm. in, in yeah. intervention. So th this, this importance of review, look, I don't know if this is true. It looks like it's made its way probably out of what we've known around working with kids with working memory mm. difficulty, yeah, like perhaps. something like a phonological deficit if you're talking about dyslexia. It's made its way into mainstream. So so parents will see, um, look, this looks really new. If, if a school uh, over you know a couple of years introduces review, and basically reviews can be there one day and it wasn't the day before. Mm. So people watch review come in and it cops a fair bit of criticism in educational circles um, because there is – there is choral response. Kids are facing the front. It looks really didactic. It's looks it, old-fashioned. It's all the stuff mm. that, yeah, we probably used to horrify educators because we're supposed to be progressive. Mm. Do you come up against that, David, or do you remember coming up against it when review became a really big part of what you're yeah, doing? Yeah, probably not so much from from parents, um, but from from other teachers, yeah. for sure. Yeah, because it looks like drill and kill, you know, and, and there's a bit of nuance involved in explaining, no, it's, not, it's actually not the case. We're not just barking at a screen and reciting stuff. We're actually having them retrieve information from their long-term memory, right? You know, there, there are occasionally, um, you know, in some of the younger years, we would do some fact fl uh, fluency chanting, but we've actually recently moved away from a lot of that stuff. Um, those slides that you mentioned at the start, Bill, those beautiful turnarounds, that, yeah, you know, my 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 heart and joy. <laughs> we don't actually use them much anymore, right? Um, so younger year levels definitely, because it's as much about exposing them to the the facts as it is. Um, you know, those instructional routines around, around fact fluency and you know, coral reading and things like that yep. too. Um, but they're not doing a lot of active retrieval. So in, in a review, if it's done poorly, you might see 20 minutes of literally just reading line from line from slides. Yep. But that's not actually retrieval practice. You're, you're just simply reading off a, off a slide, right? Yeah, exactly right. You're not actually doing much active retrieval. Gotcha. You, um, you don't have to, because there's nothing from your long-term memory that's being activated and you're just reading the information that, as it presents. Yes. So if you go into uh, a review done effectively, what you will see is still lots and lots of engagement, so still lots of student participation, but um, requires uh, active manipulation of information. So um, the danger is that it can look quite similar, right? So yeah. I've got some slides in um, in our place value section where there are two numbers on the screen and the students simply have to say top or bottom as to which one's larger. Yep. And so that, at first glance, you might say, ah, they're just bucking at the screen, right? But they are actually having to activate uh, and do some retrieval. They're actually yes. doing some active thinking there as well. Yes. Yeah, the... <sighs> I think that's probably like like the the pushback that we get from teachers is probably part of a general wave of pushback against explicit teaching. Just, you know, yeah. And it, it gets a bad rap because it's not sexy and it's not this romantic idea that we can let students discover their own knowledge and, and all that wonderful, warm, fuzzy stuff yeah. that the research says just doesn't work, yeah. mm -hmm. but that um, some teachers still, still try to cling to. Um, yeah, it, it's not sexy, but the thing is it's, like hyper, hyper effective. Um, generally, the, the antidote I've found to that is if the teachers are open-minded enough to actually come and watch a review in action mm. and actually, you know, not just sit at the back of the room, but hover around the students, watch what the students are doing, watch what the teachers are doing, uh, it tends to click. Yep. You know, so when I, I've, I've had limited a chance to work with other schools and generally when I do that, I will either run a review for students or run it for the teachers mm. themselves. Mm. And it's kind of though, it's kind of that, you know, um, the proof is in putting, like see it, seeing is believing kind of stuff, mm. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose the results, you yeah, know, for sure. yes, there is a lot of, you know, I like this, I don't like that. But ultimately as teaching professionals, we have to look at the data and we have to say what actually works and what doesn't. So what I'm hearing you say is there's a lot of research and and results that show that review works and is probably essential. 
yeah. central part of teaching. No, m- most definitely. And the, and the schools I've worked at um, have both achieved, you know, fairly, fairly remarkable results. Um, I'm hoping the results at Brandon Park improve as, you know, my tenure there increases. Otherwise, it might be an awkward conversation <laughs> with the principal in a couple of years. Well, I don't think that's going to happen <clears> more. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, very kind of you to say. Uh, and look, we can't, we can't necessarily uh, pass the results out and be like, well, we know this is from review, but it, it seems to it seems to suggest very strongly mm. that's the case. Mm. Mm. So just going back to what you were saying about that active retrieval, because I kind of think there is a bit of nuance there to explore. Yeah, yeah. Because it it isn't just about parroting back something that you've learned, and I think there's two bits to that. Because I think if you're just parroting something back, then you know thinking about what we were saying about attention before you probably don't need to pay much attention to that. You know what I mean? And so it's probably not effective Mm. as a learning tool because you can actually be thinking about something else. I can say the Lord's Prayer and think about all sorts of other things. Isn't that funny, Bill? I (laughs) thought about going to church as well and thinking, you know, I was off daydreaming but actually just happily saying all the prayers and not missing a beat but actually not thinking at all about where I was. Lord's Prayer, most certainly in your long-term memory then. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. so we don't want that to be happening in a classroom. So Mm. we're not talking about... We're talking about something subtly different to that, aren't we? Yeah. It sounds like your reviews are making... And not just getting kids to regurgitate facts, but actually actively... Solve things, think, and yeah, and do that, stuff. That's the that's the ideal, and yep. we we do need to work work towards that level. And I should point out there there is a use case for doing the regurgitation. So we we, we essentially have two types of review slides in our mass review. One is pure retrieval. I haven't retaught anything to you. It's simply here are four questions on the screen related to a skill that you've done. Go. Mm. It's like pure retrieval. But we know that some students need more than that. So often what we'll do is we'll do a re really quick reteach right before we we show them that slide. And that might involve some kind of regurgitating or reciting of an algorithm just to tune them back in and be like, hey, remember, this is a process you're about to do. Here are some questions now. Uh, but yeah, whenever possible in a perfect world, you want the the active sort of retrieval. Mm-hmm. I should point yeah. out, like like chanting multiplication facts and that sort of thing, it's okay. Yep. But what you probably don't want is you probably don't want them on the screen at the same time. Mm-hmm. So oh, you're because say, you like, get... Because um... then they just, they're just reading at that point, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. They, you say, all right, we're going to do the fours. Yeah, but we're not going to put them on the screen. Yeah, so and they'll start saying one four is four, two four is eight. They still have to do that active retrieval. Mm. Yes, yes, because there's no retrieval if it's there. Yeah. Um. So, oh gee, this is a this is a rabbit hole. Faded examples. So, just say there is something like I'm thinking of a spelling rule, right? Because mm-hmm. this is a space we're in, and part of what we're trying to do to get kids to think is the whole rule or generalization is up there and then a few weeks later there are words blocked out and then and more and more becomes blocked out and we're also trying to get kids of course to go back and work using that rule but you've really got me thinking about this business of merely regurgitating as opposed to thinking and I've got Daniel Willingham's saying memory is the residue of thought bouncing around in my head here so we do need to make kids stretch think work hard to, to pull that back out of long-term mm. memory, don't we? Yes, yeah. definitely. And yeah. In fairness, Bill, this is very new thinking for me. Yeah. So to give uh, listeners the history, I did it that way for years where like, we're, we're going to chant a, a set of multiplication yeah. facts through and it's just going to be barking at the screen. We're going to start all of our reviews. When you came through with your principles a few years ago, you would have seen me do that. Yep. Went to WA recently uh, and worked with some of the schools over there, and I was lucky enough to get like half an hour with Ingrid Seely from Teach Well. Right. And that half an hour conversation completely broke my brain in the best possible way. <laughs> Tell just, us about it. So just, just I just had some really long-standing beliefs that just got challenged in just a wonderful way. Right. Yeah. You know, I'm a I'm a guy who's very keen into science, and like it would be unconscionable for me if I was shown no, actually there's a more effective way of doing this, and it's research backed. If I did not change my practice, I'd be a massive hypocrite. And I yeah. just wouldn't be living according to my values, right? So the the uh, the the framework that Teach Well use for review, which was slightly different to mine, was uh, it is reteach, but kind of in brackets, reteach when you need to, retrieve, apply. So the yeah. apply is those yeah. slides where there's crunching numbers on a whiteboard. Let's go, um, but the retrieval is that active sort of retrieval that we mm-hmm. were we're after as well. And yeah. like retreat, reteaching kind of only when necessary. Yes. Whereas um, I was using more of a you know, like a recite, recall, apply framework where we're doing some um, reciting from a slide, but that's probably not as active retrieval as reteaching might be, mm. or skipping straight to retrieving. Yep, yep. I've oh. used a lot of R words there. Yeah. This it, is this is actually really good 
to hear because we do well, who said it teaching is an incredibly fast habit forming profession and we do need to always be looking at what are we doing mm. and we we form we form assumptions fast don't we oh for sure yeah yeah so this is actually a really good conversation for me and at, it's at such this very a lot point. of work yes. i mean teaching is so much work yeah that when you f- uh, find a routine that works for you and seems to work for the kids it's actually quite painful to have to change the way you teach you know what i mean as it the cognitive load for a teacher mm. is huge when you go oh really yeah I, I thought you know i now have to change the way i do this i mean i you do it anyway but there, there i think that does put a little bit of a reluctance there you know a little bit of a like oh gosh this is so much more new stuff to learn it's exciting but it's also how how am i going to fit this into the day yeah, m- most definitely. Yeah. Like it's it's one of those professions that it's just ripe for cognitive overload. Mm. Oh, yeah. You know, you're you're managing oh, yeah. the the attention and behavior of your students. You're also managing your own content knowledge because, like, good luck trying to get like someone straight out of high school to teach like three by three digit multiplication or something really complex. You know, forget high school level maths. So you've got the content yeah. knowledge as well, then the pedagogical knowledge too. So like, all right, I need to make sure I'm hitting all of my ADI norms. So yeah, and like, ironically. <laughs> Te- you know, the more runs you have on the board as a teacher and the more lessons you do, guess what you're doing? You're reviewing. So you're reviewing those pedagogical and content knowledge structures. They become embedded into your long-term memory and that is what leads you to becoming a much more effective teacher. You have more cognitive load that you can spend on mm. the stuff that matters, yeah. on you know, managing your behavior and attention and to really uh, you know, doing incredible checking for understanding and like really scaffolding for your students' mm. knowledge. Yeah, so the teacher gets to pay more attention <laughs> to what's happening in the class. Exactly right. And from the sounds of it with what you're doing, and this is a bit of a theme of the last few podcasts, Bill. Yeah. The idea of this low curriculum variance, the idea of having a shared vocabulary, you know, a whole school approach to doing something and having a lesson structure and a scope and sequence really then does a lot to free the teacher up, you know, to free up that cognitive load for the teacher Mm -hmm. and know that what they're doing is solid. Um, But now I've got the headspace to go, okay, well, I know what I'm doing now. Yeah. And I've got the time to now focus on this or, on hey, the, the kids didn't quite get that. Yeah. I could try this way. I could try that way. Yep. You know, it gives you a bit more flexibility because you're not having to, you know, reinvent the wheel every time. That's every right. Time exactly you teach right. That's right. See, we, we don't want <laughs> yeah. teachers having to talk or discuss and waste time about what to teach. Mm. No. We'd rather they spend that, that resource uh, talking about how to teach. Mm. So if I relate this back, and, and I'd be interested in your opinion on this, like, you know, working in the um, intervention space, you know, we're not working with classes, we're working with one or two kids at a time. Mm. And kind of inbuilt into the structure that I do with literacy and maths is pretty much every time a kid learns something new, they get a card or one or two cards with a summary of what they've learned. You know, so if it's a letter sound, you know, they get to choose a word that starts with that sound, you know, ink, ear, they draw a picture and then every lesson that gets reviewed and hopefully actually every day at home that gets reviewed because we want to practice, 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 embed that. Now, we don't kind of call it structured review like you are, but, you know, listening to you speak, that's exactly what it is. Inbuilt to every lesson, you essentially review everything you have ever taught the kid. And over years, th- those decks of cards become really thick. They you know do. what I mean? Yeah. And, yeah. I, and that sounds like it could be overwhelming for the kid, but actually I find the kids have a huge amount of pride. You know what I mean? Yeah, I go for through sure. a big stack of concept cards and I say to the kid, look how much stuff you know. Like that is really, really impressive. Yeah. I bet your teacher doesn't know half this stuff yeah. that you can yeah. just rattle, it off, rattle off. But we, we do the same thing at the end of mass reviews mm. sometimes and I'll say, that was 25 minutes. We did 15 different things there yep. and yeah. you, you crushed it all. Like, look how much you've actually managed yeah. to learn, you know, throughout the, the course of a school year. So that's a huge boost for a kid's confidence. Yeah. And, yep. it, and it sends a real message to a kid that if something's really hard, persist because you can learn it mm. because here's proof that you can learn it. And so I'm thinking, you know, it kind of deals with that kid who can hide away in the corner. You know, that kid that 
goes under the radar. Yeah. yeah. And if it is a kind of a repetitive coral thing, they can move their mouth in, t- in time yeah. with the other kids. You know exactly what I mean? Right, yeah, totally. there, there will be kids like that. And But the kind of review you're talking about brings them out from the dark, you know what I mean? Because they need to be doing it. Mm-hmm. But it just makes me think in a class of kids, you know, there's no hiding when it's one-on-one tutoring, but in a class mm. of kids, if I've got 30 kids and I'm doing these reviews, as a teacher, how do you know... If the kid is just sitting there parroting it or not, that's like, a, what, a like, great question. So, the, look, the oral response stuff, it is difficult. Like, mm. I tend to roam around the room and I can kind of tell, like, from hearing the volume of where I'm standing, who's doing it and who isn't. Uh, and I'm very quick to call kids out because, you know, essentially the the basic rules, and this I ripped straight from Ethan Ford, who was an ex teacher at Bentley West, is like, the in like our essential agreement is uh, work hard and be nice. That's it. Five words. <laughs> work hard and be nice. Like, hey, you're not working hard. Yeah. Like, we agreed we're all going to work yeah. hard. Um, yeah, look, I would I, like that's a wonderful example with with the cards with your kids with tutoring. Like, this research is so accessible and easy to understand that we talk through it with our students. Yeah. My grade fives know about Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve, yeah. Yeah. and the the fours at Bentley West know as well, right? So, we we talk about this stuff. They know about the importance of review. They know that learning, like the goal with learning, is to transfer knowledge mm-hmm. into their long term memory. They know that some kids need more practice than others so it also it's a great empathy piece mm. as well for the students mm. that might be struggling and it's a great life skill yeah because you're teaching them how to learn oh it is i'm so glad you mentioned mm. that i'm so glad you mentioned that because this stuff like i i often say when i do talks like hey i'll put my money where my mouth is like you can do this your, yourself right a great example is language learning so i'm learning japanese at the moment um because my uh, my brother's partner's japanese so i've got a half japanese nephew and so in four or five months i've learned 200 kanji almost a thousand words through using a spaced repetition app that uh-huh. uses retrieval practice yeah. right uh, and it's it's amazing and every time i'm about to do a review and i'm thinking man i've forgotten so much stuff and they come up and bang i can just smash them out and you know i'm getting like 90 percent accuracy and, and mm. all, all that sort of thing so w- the good thing is as well when i get it wrong the software yeah. will give it to me more often yeah so it's really really like hyper responsive in a way that as classroom teachers we just can't be mm. but yeah. it, it works for everything like it works for learning an instrument it works for learning yeah as you said learning everything Mm. Yeah, at Bentley West, um, shout out to Brennan Walsh, our wonderful PE teacher that's there. He does reviews in PE. Like, here's the skill we did last week. Here's a skill we did last term. He does, you know, full EDI through PE. And as a result, the kids at Bentley West, mate, they crush the other schools. Wow. <laughs> They're incredible. <laughs> they, the g- girls just won state hockey. And yeah. I was really excited. I thought, oh, never going to go to the Nationals. Turns <laughs> out, no Nationals. So they've they've won. They just... they. They clocked hockey. They beat hockey. <laughs> like, they broke hockey. They, they, that's it. They broke the game. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to EDI and Review, man. That is incredible because I was going to say PE would be the last place you'd expect this, but hang on. Oh, I trained as a on. PE Isn't teacher. PE, well, me too. And, and it is PE all is about breaking skills yeah. into little pieces and yeah. a lot of practice of those pieces. Yeah. So this stuff is in the wheelhouse. There's pretty much no skill. other way you can learn a skill. Yeah, you know, yeah. physical skill. If we're talking about PE, that's right. Other than repetition, yeah, mm-hmm. and repetition of the right skill. Like yeah, it's what you mentioned there's before. No point, yep. You know, yeah. doing a hundred forehands that are sloppy. I'm going because because <laughs> that's, that's right. what you're going to embed. I'm about to absolutely butcher an example Steve Cat <laughs> gave, and Steve, I'm sorry if you hear this, but I'll do my best. All right. <laughs> um, Steve was talking about explicit teaching of literacy. And I think he was drawing a, he's making a a metaphor about whole language and he kind of said it's like holding a, giving a kid a tennis racket and saying, or saying to the kid, watch me hit a few forehands. Now hit a perfect forehand. Mm. He said, we don't do that. If we're teaching a good forehand, we will, we will break that skill up into its pieces and there's going to be practice of those individual pieces and then we'll bring it together. We'll integrate it. So this is what it is, really, mm. isn't it? It's yeah. not. It's not an oversimplification. That no. is how you how you go from novice to master. Yep, it's yeah, just it's again the the sports analogy is just putting the runs on the board, like it's just getting your reps in. Yeah, and so yeah, what kind of advice would you have? For, so you know, I'm a teacher listening to this now, and I don't do this, or my school doesn't do it. What sort of advice have you got for getting started with it? You know, yeah, because so, it, it sounds. What you've got sounds incredibly complicated and Agreed, yeah. sounds pretty much unachievable unless you've got an entire school 
commitment to it. Mm-hmm. And from what I understand, that's fairly unusual. No, look, most of the teachers <laughs> that I correspond with, they, they tend to be like islands, right? Like yeah. they're, they're these oases in their schools where they're probably the only <laughs> teacher doing evidence-based instruction mm, uh, and yep. which, which like man i got so much time and respect for them i, I, I don't know what that's like because i was lucky enough to to wind up at these um schools that have the whole school approach so yeah our particular approach is completely undoable if you're solo i would have actually you know what, i'm going to walk that back because now that ochre have got their stuff it's actually way more achievable than it ever has been mm, mm. and is so, ochre just maths or is ochre at the moment yeah they do yeah. they do other stuff but they're, they're, they're forward facing stuff their free resources are on the math space yep. um so ochre for, for the listeners it's o-c-h-r-e i'm sure you guys will chuck them in the show notes yeah. that's a, that's, yeah, a very, will, yeah. that's a very podcasting to say isn't it <laughs> i will is chuck those in the podcast there we nice. go yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so ochre's ochre's master review decks are really terrific in maths um and Slight plug to myself. Um, they're they're partially built on some of my older review materials. Uh-huh. So um, so Reed took some resources of mine and adapted them for their for mm-hmm. their use. And we still use some of them at Brandon Park as well. Right. In addition to creating our own resources. So my advice for a teacher in the math space that's looking at reviewing is check out Oka stuff uh, and just have a think about what you've taught recently, what you think your students are in danger of forgetting, and just start reintroducing that stuff. But you don't need to become some PowerPoint dark wizard to do this stuff. Yeah, yeah. You just need to be to think slightly deliberately about all right, what have we just taught? Uh, what do I think they're going to forget? You know, so mm-hmm. it might be all right. We did pronouns a couple of days ago. It's time for us to review that. And you know, you might have spent, you might have done a forty-five minute lesson on pronouns. Take five minutes to review it. Yeah, you know, it doesn't need to be anywhere near as long as your lesson. Mm. Yeah. Uh, if you just do those first couple of steps, uh, you'd be surprised at how much your students end up oh, yeah. remembering. And, and look in in the literacy intervention and in my maths intervention as well. It's not five minutes just on that one point. It's five minutes to review everything yeah. you've done in the last 12 months. Yeah, Like yeah. we whip through those cards fast and it may just be, you know, an instant recall of that fact that they've learnt. Mm. And, you know, as we say, that's n- not enough. But what I'll do is intersperse that with a, throw them a curly, you know, throw them a curly question in the middle of it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we'll be doing something like... Know, an adjective and I'll say, you know, an adjective describes a noun and then I'll just stop and I'll say, okay, well, what what suffixes could you use to make an adjective? Yeah, nice. And, you know, and they'll go, oh, what? And, you know, get them to think, have a conversation about it. Takes 30 seconds yes. and then on we go again with the rest of the cards and every now and then throw something like yes. that in so that yeah. it isn't just parroting it back. No, it's it's it's. And the kid doesn't think. know when you're going to be stopping and quizzing them on a particular thing. You know what I mean? So it yeah. kind of keeps them Keeping them on yeah. their toes, yeah, for active. sure. Yeah, and keeping yes. them engaged as well. That sounds highly engaging. And yeah. that, that, that's part of the art um, of what we do. It's the knowing when to question, how to question. And my mentor, Alison Playford, who is the play in Playberry, would always say, you have to make them think. Mm. You've got to make them think. And it, this is... This is this turns out to be the most important thing, and this is probably the nuance between simply parroting and yep. retrieving. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's there's active work in retrieving. Um, Mark, what you were saying just before, uh, if we, if we're plugging, here we go. Um, this is what we're trying to do in Playberry Laser. We, when you said there's no magic formula about when to bring stuff back, we have to make those decisions about. Which concepts are the ones that are hard to stick in experience teaches that, and they're the ones with a higher rate of retrieval. But um, I find so more in your experience, you've had to you've had to build your own card decks at Bentley West and you, and make those tough decisions. Are you seeing more products come onto the market that make those decisions about when stuff comes back around? You mentioned that app you're using to learn a language. Yeah, they must be working on an algorithm. Yeah, mm. definitely. Uh, and I don't think they 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 probably keep that as sort of proprietary information. I yeah. don't know that they surface that. Um, so the the one I'm using is specifically for Japanese. It's a, a website called Wanikani. Yeah. But the big one that's in this space and Ollie Lovell loves this one. Anki. It's, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's Anki, right? So so Anki is the Japanese word for memorize gotcha um so so anki's amazing for this and he uses it one of the uses that he uses that's really genius is he, all of his like book notes 
um, he will put those into flashcards. So any yeah. highlights from a book that he reads, and he'll review those regularly. Unlike this guy, I'm pointing to myself who's read like 50 books this year <laughs> and asked me about any of them. I don't remember a thing, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, those, those products do exist. And I wonder if I, someone's probably reverse engineered or even like the Yankee guy's an Aussie dude. And it's just a single developer, right? right? He's probably surfaced that in a blog post somewhere of like, this is the formula it's running on. Yeah. And in fact, you can tweak that in your settings for particular decks. You can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I'm using it to memorize Greek and Latin uh, roots that are hard to stick. And I'm noticing that and I have yeah. played with the settings and it's pretty effective. Give me, give me a Latin root that you're finding hard to stick and I'll see if my OG training uh, Okay. Um, mys, mit, miss. Oh. Does it mean to send? Yep. There we go. Beautiful. Well <laughs> done. Not just a mask guy. There we go. Oh, that is incredible. <laughs> Hallelujah. Man, that, that could have been real awkward. That <laughs> definitely wasn't edited in. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. You did it, mate. You know. Yeah, it. Um, yeah look, it, it is It is tricky. The, the, I'm sure someone will crack the code. Maybe you'll do it yourself, uh, Bill, with, with Playberry Laser of, of, of finding out this Goldilocks zone. But I, my gut feeling says it is really skill and concept uh, dependent. So the fact that you're deliberately... Um, Increasing the frequency of uh, retrievals for concepts that you know are hardest to stick, I think that's that's the way to go. Like being purposeful about that will be really useful. Well, that's mm. the plan. We're just nothing perfect yet. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. And now, yeah. I, I mean, just a, another little question I have, um, because this is kind of an instinct that I have, but I don't know if, if you're aware if there's any research or anything on it. But I think a big part of learning and successful learning is feeling a sense of reward and achievement, you know? Yeah. And so the thing about that um, review, is there in built into that a positive reinforcement kind of routine in it for the kids? You mm. know, like when we talk about behaviour and getting behaviour change and so on, then we want to build in positive reinforcement for the things that we want the kids to be doing and either ignoring or, you know, negative for the kids with, for the things we don't want them to be doing and every now and then you also want to build in a bit of a jackpot you know to say you know for an example with a kid you know if they've been struggling to remember a concept for example and it might be three four or five weeks they've been struggling with this card you know because we do these card reviews and then they get it i make a massive deal of it that is like Man, that is so amazing. We stop, you know, I congratulate them. I give them an extra two stamps on their award sheet kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a big part of learning. Like, I think that helps make stuff stick. Yeah. If you get those good feelings about it, you know, that positive reinforcement. Number one, it's hooking an emotion to a moment. And emotion is very important. in Yeah, that that reward as part of learning. Yeah. Yeah. Is that... And it's not, it's like classic intrinsic motivation as well, because you're not telling them, hey, if you get this correct, I'm going to make a big deal and give you two extra stamps, right? You're doing that as a matter of course. Yeah. So you're like, it's they're genuine. intrinsically, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So they're genuine intrinsically motivated to yeah. do it. And then that's just the cherry on top. And yeah. they'll have that positive association with whatever you've done. Yeah, I think reviews massively help because they inherently lead to better retention of knowledge. You know, they lead to more accurate uh, uh, performance of skills, right? So, students really do get to see well, wow it turns out I've actually grown massively in this space mm-hmm. you know um, something I've talked about at, at, at conferences I will get kids coming up to me at the start of the year and one of the first things I ask them is um, you know put your hand up if you if you like maths and there'll be like you know a third of the class who don't and I you know I lean into it you know it's very performative of you know I clutch my heart in, in horror like oh, I can't believe you don't like maths and so I make them a vow right I say to them yeah. look I'm not going to promise that maths will be your favourite class by the end of the school year but I guarantee you'll feel better about it and you won't hate it anymore yep. so far in my career of you know basically a decade 100% success rate. I've that never had a kid huge. at the end of the year not say, I like maths more than I used to. Yeah. You know, and a lot of them will say, it's now my favorite class. Mm. I think that is because they get to experience success. Yes. I think a lot of the discourse about maths teaching and about teaching in general, um, we have things backwards. They think, well, everything needs to be hyper-engaging as basically be the fast food of teaching, you know, like it's full sugar and fat. 
tons of graphics on the screen. We're going to play maths through games, all this fun stuff, and that's going to somehow increase motivation. But it's in fact those experiences of success that mm-hmm. do that, especially among the kids that have like knocked their heads yeah. against something for a long time without experiencing that. You know, so meeting a kid at their level of need, giving them the support they need, and then getting that success from them, it's yeah. It's why we do the gig, man. It's you the know, best feeling. That is that is beautiful, David. I, I wish. Well, we have recorded that. Um, <laughs> two things bumped in. Oh wait, I forgot to press record. Oh no! <laughs> oh gosh, down at the head. I don't know. I've got another one in me. Yeah. Um, two things popped into my head. Then uh, I love that sh- that high sugar, high fat analogy about oh, engagement and learning, which has poisoned um, Australian education for too long. Mm. John Hattie said. Somewhere, I was learning is hard, right? Learning is hard at times. It takes it takes labour to learn something that is hard, right? And we, I think, the sooner we get kids' heads around that, the better. And then attribution theory jumps into my head, which is helping youngsters attribute a success in learning to the work they put in. There's just no magic here. Mm. It is. You know, it's. I, I'm just so glad you said that. I haven't heard it put so well, and it's and it's been toxic for our results in Australia. Mm-hmm. That fast food, junk food, and for kids' education, entertainment. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah, it's hard graft. And look, it, to to speak broader, I think it probably links to as a species our inability to pay attention for long periods of time now. Yes. Like because like our brains are cooked like smartphones and social media have, have just ruined our ability to, to, to pay attention <laughs> yeah. are you guys fans of Cal Newport's work at all not haven't heard of it yet. so, so uh, he wrote two really really great books he wrote Deep Work and he wrote Digital Minimalism and Deep Work is all about the fact that um, if you you know if you want to create amazing things in the world, you really need to harness that power to concentrate deeply for long periods of time. Mm. And then digital minimalism is basically a 400 page of, oi, put your phone away, mm. <laughs> essentially, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, as, as a species, we, we are rapidly losing that ability. And it's something I speak to my kids about as well, just as I speak to them about the forgetting curve and say, you know, same thing that you've just said, Bill, learning is difficult. It mm. requires lots and lots of repetition. We need to put the hard yards in while we're, while we're here. You know, at the start, the start of a school year, um, I'll say to them, look, we got 900 hours together so it sounds like a large number i promise you it'll be over like that all right it will go in the blink of an eye this is lightning in a bottle like this combination of people (laughs) we will never be together beyond this year so take advantage of it while we can Mm. just the idea of you know respecting the time because the instructional time is ultimately the one resource as teachers we don't get more of Mm. yeah and see that that just sounds to me like a fantastic way to focus kids attention Mm. you know build that urgency build that need to be in this moment and get the most from it that you can and this review provides that opportunity in every lesson to give positive feedback yeah every lesson you're saying check it out look excellent well done you know all this stuff which really primes you then for the next thing they're going to learn and building their confidence that they can do it and they can keep improving. Beautiful, positive feedback Mm. loop. Like Greg Ashman's talked about it. Again, it's the success and motivation stuff. Mm. Motivation comes through experiencing success, which gives you more motivation that will lead you to to focus that energy and get more success. So it just becomes a runaway freight train. Wow, that's fantastic. Now, so we've been talking about schools. Uh, We've been talking about a bit about intervention. Yeah. But I suspect that there's something in here for parents. Because, you know, just thinking on the spot here and listening to what you're saying, I could see how it would be a useful, a productive use of parents' time to do some kind of review with their kid. So let's say the school's not doing it. But let's say I'm a parent. I keep an eye on what my kid's doing, you know, see what homework they're doing. There's nothing to stop me as a parent each week for example, to make a little card or make a little summary of the new kid that the thing, new thing the kids learn and do a review with them. For sure, yeah. You could really do this at home. Absolutely. Even if you don't necessarily understand it to the level that a teacher might understand it, you can actually sit down and do a weekly review with your kid. Most definitely. And, And to be fair, like... You shouldn't have to, but no, that is the current yeah. state of things, yeah. unfortunately. And hopefully, you know, within the next X number of years, that won't be an issue that we need our parents to have to shoulder the burden for anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, you are you're spot on. Like, you know, take a few things that you know your 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 child has been learning, uh, and it could be something as simple as a definition. 
right? Yep. You know, they've just learned about um, they've just learned about let's let's say you're doing you've got a school that's doing core knowledge and they've just learned about the three world religions and say, all right, you know, can you remember the five pillars of Islam? You know, yep. doing that active retrieval mm. uh, and you know, giving them a nudge in the right direction if they don't get it all the way there, and then maybe testing them the next day without that scaffold. Mm. All, right, all right, give me give me the the pillars again. Let's see how you go. Or even using one of those apps. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, Anki yep. is amazing. Yep. Um, if you buy it on iOS, it's forty bucks, but it's a one-time charge. Every other device, it's free. Yes, yeah, yep. so I've sent a few kids away. I've said, "Hand some come my secondary students. Hand me your phone. I'm going to download this app, and we've put some stuff they've been finding it hard to store into Anki." Yeah, and so yeah, yeah. I mean, in intervention, we expect parents to take an active role. You know, because we only see the kids for an hour a week. Oh, we can't do it and, on our own. And that's of not enough. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, part of the having the card deck oh, is yeah. that the kid takes it home with them and, the, and yeah. they practice it with their parents. Um, but, you know, just thinking aloud, I- even if you're not in the intervention space, there's nothing to stop a parent from listening to what we're doing, particularly a parent of a kid living with a learning difficulty, mm. where we sadly we know that they're not going to get enough repetition at school. Yeah. Even perhaps in specialist schools, you know, even in schools that that specialise supporting kids with learning difficulties, of course, there yeah. just aren't enough hours in the day mm-hmm. or enough resources to give them what they need, and so it's kind of a, you know, I wouldn't say essential because I don't want to guilt people, but you know, I think it's important if you can to mm. to play a role as a parent, yeah, even and. And I know it's a struggle, isn't it? You know, because yeah. often parents themselves live with learning difficulties. Yes, of and course. Yeah, we, I know we know their hereditary, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I ran a 1,000 miles when my kids were going to literacy tutoring because I was terrified of it because I couldn't do it myself, you know, and yeah. I was scared of those cards because I didn't understand them. And so I think, you know, having a, just a simple review that you could do yeah. as a parent yeah, and knowing that you're doing something. Yeah, yes. absolutely. You know what I mean? And sometimes just knowing that you're doing something. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and you're yeah. not powerless. And, and, and that know, something you, is is uh, is not going to cause harm. It can only help. Yeah, it, yeah. it actually sounds incredibly powerful by the sounds of it. Yeah, and the good news is like, um, like you, you don't have to understand the pedagogical nuance or even the research that goes behind it to, to make advantage of it, right? Like, to take advantage of it. You know, if you download Anki, you're getting, getting the benefits from that kind of stuff anyway. You don't have to worry about what's happening under the hood. Yep. Yeah. You know, I've just thought like you got a kid who's off to primary school next year, tying their shoelaces, perfect. Show them how to do it. Some faded worked examples, Bill. Just yep. have them do the last knot themselves. Oh, and then in a week or now two. We're all right, there. now you've got to yep. do the last two knots. And then instead of, all right, I want you to practice this 10 times in a row right now, it's like, nope, we're going to do it once today. We're going to do it yep. once tomorrow. We're going to do it once the day after that mm-hmm. and just go from there. Yeah. Oh. And, <laughs> and the great thing Pretty about beautiful. that, you know, is that it's not overwhelming the kid. Yeah. You know, because I'm thinking of kids living with ADHD and you make them sit and tie their two laces, shoelaces 10 times yeah that's probably a bridge too far but mm. building it up and doing it once and then spacing it out and doing it again another couple of days yeah is it makes it less less of a it's, hurdle doesn't you know, it it's learning to yeah. drive you yeah. know when you're on your L's you don't piss off across the Malibor it's like let's do <laughs> let's do some 10 well, what I did wrong <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, I've got I've got my 120 hours I managed it in three weeks somehow yeah so just like it's doing short trips That's you know right. they, 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 they say that in like um, they must say it here as well but they say it in Victoria when you buy the learner's book from a petrol station like hey short trips are better than long trips yeah. so like that this research has you know bled through to other places yes. as well um, yeah and, and like I I, I mean this truly to your listeners like try this in your own learning as well mm. like you'd be surprised at how much more you remember if you're reviewing stuff absolutely yeah it's and, and you it's, it's you can't do this with the kids and not for yourself because you know what we share the same cognitive architecture mm. we all learn pretty much the same way don't we yeah. yes yes we do. yeah well oh, fantastic my gosh the last question here um david before we wrap up Look, it might be an oversimplified question. It's it's what common mistakes do teachers make when they begin out with review routines? Is there something, are there any minds buried beneath the ground we can help teachers avoid here? Yeah, so we've already touched on the first one, which is um, mistaking uh, a lot of chanting um, yep. and reading a screen with, with active retrieval. Yep. So when, whenever possible, go for the second. Yep. Um, but I have got two others that I, I thought about. The first thing is that reviews are often the first thing to go when teachers are time poor. 
So as in, oh, I've got the athletics carnival, so we don't have time for the mass review. We'll just do the lesson today. Um, my strong advice is to do the reverse mm. and instead leave the new lesson for another day. Yeah. So um, we we do you know swimming program um, in, in Victoria and it's generally two weeks. So I've instructed my teams uh, who are time poor because we lose about two and a half hours of instructional time mm. uh, a day for, for two weeks. I've said, Pause new lessons. Review. Just review. That makes so right? much sense. So that would be my first one. Don't don't jettison it when you're you're time poor. Um, like when whenever possible, make sure it goes in most days. Uh, and the other one is, and uh, the way that I've structured my reviews when my students are doing whiteboard work is we tend to have multiple questions for a skill. Um, it's just the idea of maximizing time on task. So I'm catering to you know different ability levels. So if I've got like a subtraction example, the first question might be two digits. The last one may, might be some ungodly eight-digit one, right? Um, and what we want is we we want the students to uh, give us a minimum amount of expected effort, but don't uh, don't wait for every student to try every question uh-huh. because that's a that's the perfect way to turn a twenty-minute review into a two-hour monstrosity. So um, <laughs> that does require some fairly strong instructional routines at the start of the school year because you're going to have some kids really cranky that you're moving on early. Yeah. You just have to say to them. I reward, and this is a great Sarah Sohm uh, thing, I reward effort, not outcome. Yep. I don't care if you finish. What I want you to do is to, hey, work hard and be kind. So Brilliant. just want you to do what you can. So generally, once I see that my students have finished the first question, regardless of where they're up to, uh, and you know, by the time some of my students do one, some kids will have done all four, mm. that's it, we move on. Um, so yeah, don't don't get hung up on, on that either. Um, so yeah. those have been my two big ones. So um, don't jettison it when you're time poor. Uh, and once your students have displayed some kind of minimum uh, expected effort, move on. Don't yeah. expect mm. every kid to do every question. But that's fantastic. Um, really, yeah. really do like that middle one. Why try and jam something else in there when you can just keep them off the forgetting curve? Yeah, yeah. exactly right. Yeah. Um, where we know, like speaking in the math space, the, the, the curriculum isn't exactly, you know, it's not hugely rigorous. You, you were mentioning in the last episode, uh, Bill, the Ben Jensen episode of the um, ER yeah. podcast. Yeah. You know, just seeing the difference between Australia and some other countries in terms of the rigor of the curriculum. Yeah. Um, so missing two weeks worth of new lessons for swimming and reviewing instead will not hurt you. You will still comfortably cover the curriculum in a school year. Yep. Okay. And now, for people who are new to it, are there any examples they can see out there? Like, have you got any examples online of what a review looks like or... You know, because sometimes to see one, you know, suddenly it clicks and it makes sense. For sure, than it's kind of just us trying to describe it in words. Yeah, so so I I do have a couple of YouTube videos. They're they're a few years old, um, so they don't reflect my current thinking. The discussion we had before about mm. um, you know, the reciting versus active retrieval, um, they're not really in there. But if you um, if people Google my name, they can go to those YouTube videos. They're more of an explainer of what reviews are rather than demonstration. Right. Like, because yeah. I, I I would love to do that, but just you know, privacy reasons. I don't want to yeah. be putting uh, videos of my students up online. Yeah. I've thought of perhaps doing one where the camera is just centered on me and you mm-hmm. can't actually see what's mm-hmm. happening. You will miss a lot of the magic of like, you know, not being able to see students clean their whiteboards and that sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah. If, if at all possible, uh, if you know someone in this space who is doing reviews, uh, if you can go and watch them doing one, that is really powerful. When uh, the few times that I've managed to work with other schools, I've generally run sessions, as I said at the start of the episode, where I will do a review while teachers are looking or I'll make the teachers do them as though they're the students as well. Because you're absolutely right, Michael. So like seeing is is believing and um, we can talk about the theory and the practice beso- be- behind it, but actually seeing one for real uh, is is massively powerful. Mm. We can um, pop a few videos up from our platform there. You, we've got permissions of, of – well, it's not – it's a section of the lesson. Yep. But there is some review going on. Mm. But um, uh, more watching you teach was a revelation for me. And I know you look back and you go, oh, there are things I'd do differently now. Mm. But I tell you what, mate, that was still highly, highly impactful teaching. Thanks, Bill. That's, yeah. that, that's, uh, that's high praise coming from you, man. Oh, mate. Oh, stop it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wonderful. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time. It's been amazing. I mean, I've learned so much and I just think, why haven't we spoken about this before? You know what I mean? It's Mm. like it it feels like a a real missing link. Well, it's been hiding there in plain sight, Michael, because review is fundamental to what we do every day. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, We don't call it that, but Mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like it's... 
embedded in schools. Yet. No, yeah. it's getting there. Yeah, we're getting our head around it. We we shake we're shaking off all the ridiculous ideological poop from the past <laughs> and uh, learning a bit about how the brain works and learns and stores. So yeah, it's been wonderful and. Uh, Thank you for your time, Mr. Morkunis. Of course, yeah. man. No, I'm absolutely thrilled to have to have done it. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Michael. Once again, and thank you everyone for listening. Remember, you can visit discastia.com to get the show notes. We'll put as much stuff there as we can. We'll put your videos on there and anything else that we can think of that we think might be helpful. Yeah. You can follow us on social media and we love it when you make comments. Because, we do. Uh, you know, it's great to know people are listening and getting that feedback is excellent. And if you ever bump into us, David, Michael or I, and you like this cast, you come up and tell us and we'll get a big <laughs> fat head and we'll walk away thinking we're doing some good. So. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Thanks, David. Thanks, Thanks guys. Everyone. See ya.